Welcome everyone for a special video. Today I've got my guest here, Andre, who is my film partner also. Howdy. Some may recognize him if you've seen the films. And today we're gonna to be doing a discussion on film criticism. And this is gonna encapsulate also, you know, whether we need film critics. It's also gonna look at ratings and it's gonna look at how reviewing is done today and whether it really holds a place today. So yeah, that's really it. We're just gonna focus on discussions around film ratings, review sites, critics, and how watching is king in a sense too. I mean, there's so many discussions, so many discussion points, there's so many places to begin. Is there anything you'd like to start off with, Andre? Uh, really just the fact that, um, and ever since the dawn of they're not really, it's just, as time's going on, nowadays it is just, it's everywhere about like ratings, about what did this, what score did this film get? That seems to be more important than the usual things back in the day, like what's the genre, who's in it? who's directing it, that sort of things. It's all about, it just seems to be all about the range. That seems to be something that's taken over, in mm -hmm. a sense. And I think Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb are probably the, the biggest reasons for that. I'm not sure which one. Mm -hmm. IMDb started in like the mid-90s, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I just turned 20 years old recently. But as you'll see on IMDb, the top two films have been, almost since the beginning of time, has been The Godfather and The Shawshank Redemption, yeah. which is, mm -hmm. it, it's a common known fact today. If you're a film watcher, like everyone has looked at the IMDb top 250, but mm. pe what people don't realize is, is it's a populist list. Um, what you'll see now is a lot of films that are getting wider releases are being seen by more people and are more recent, i.e. you know the films coming out as of now. They are being more seen, therefore more ratings are being attached to them, so that's why now older films are being bumped off the top 250 list. Um, <clears throat> and it's debatable why The Godfather and... Well, not the Godfather, but more so the, the Shawshank Redemption still continues to be the number one has rate of film, and it also goes by the number, not just the ratings. It goes by an average, of course, but you have to consider it's IMDb, and some people hold that, you know, as the Bible. You know, yeah. like yeah. that is that is the truth. I mean, I've my friend, friends myself who aren't film students or film critics or even big film offs, but they are actually trying to make their way through this top 250 list as if yeah. it says like an essential list of films that you need to have seen yeah and I was there too you know from getting into film around 15, 16 by the time I was 20 or 19 I would have got through about 200 of the films mm. and because it's constantly changing you know you end up having to catch up but it's, it's interesting to see how many of the older films are on that list like yeah. 12 Angry Men is in the top 15 still rightly so rightly so indeed uh -huh. um but anyway, it really doesn't mean much. And some people, it seems to be in the younger audiences anyway, the, the younger film film buffs, mm. they kind of care about these sort of things more. And Rotten Tomatoes is another, I think, a very important one to bring up now because more so than IMDb, I think people really go to there to, because it harvests reviews mm. from everywhere, whether it's The Guardian or Empire or Total Film or anywhere right. like that. Even Roger Roberts' ratings would go there and... It's a very different kind of rating, uh, uh, the way it balances out the averages, and then there's consensus, and then there's audience reviews, and uh, and ratings. So, is there anything you could say about that around tomorrow? It's, it's it's something I've stayed away from. It's almost something a bit of a, oh, a bad phrase for me. Around tomorrow, it's just I don't, it's just something about it. I would use IMDb more mainly because of like the, the trivia, etc handy there and it's just a it's a good place to log the films that you've seen but Rotten Tomatoes it's just not something it's ever appealed to me especially seeing as there are a couple of times where you have a real disparity between critical reception and general audience reception there's a couple of titles in the past couple of years have been the case well like yeah I <clears throat> I actually started on Rotten Tomatoes in 2010 mm -hmm. like that was at the very beginning and I would have actually reviewed a lot of films that's when I was really big in the animation so this is when I specifically know a couple of films that were coming out at the time. It was Toy Story 3 and, mm. and Tangled and stuff that were coming out. And I remember using Rotten Tomatoes. And they really messed something up with um, the ability to send your reviews to people in your friend list on your, on, on your messages. And that's how everyone would review each other, or everyone would see each other's reviews. And I did mm. remember a lot of people doing that back and forth. And then something just broke. So <laughs> then I just stopped using it. And, you know, I realized it. I don't really like the... It's a dead community now. No one really uses that to review things now. It's all kind of starting to... And now we've got Letterboxd, which is kind of a godsend, but also now it's starting to... It's becoming toxic, <laughs> which you start to see. Uh, the more people... Because it used to be... I remember I got an email, and it used to be something that you had to get an email to sign up to 
right. like in its early days like you had to get an email to join so it was very exclusive for like the first six months and then that was probably just because they hadn't set up the servers yet but now it's starting to become like an IMDB where you're getting these very general people writing reviews and rating things you know and that's nothing right. you, you have to take away a pinch of salt because people are just rating things for the crack and reviewing things like mm. some people's reviews could be just two words or something stupid or yeah. a catchphrase from the film so you know it's great like it's mm. pros and cons but yeah I mean it's great that everyone's able to have their say it's not just the big dogs nowadays anyone can go on write a review on whatever platform it's good it's great to have that platform but available for everyone it means that the, the small fish can't become the big fish over time if that's something they want to get into but you were saying there about toxic about how toxic this can be and I think this is a big problem with the rating systems is that it's almost like what oh, you only gave that a six what the hell right like, yeah. what, like, what, what is wrong with you is it, you're getting in this you're, people are getting in these really heated debates right. over, <laughs> over a number over like a, one or two yeah. extra stars and sure like a good example of that is MDB had to remove their message boards right because they, they was just getting to such an extent so yeah. such a toxic community that it was just it wasn't worth the hassle anymore. They just thought no, it's not enough is enough. And that's 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 definitely a great thing to bring up about the importance of the ratings alone because a lot of film buffs, a lot of us that are like, you know, we're just so geeky, we wanna log all our films, we wanna rate them, we wanna put them in lists and stuff, mm-hmm. how much we like them. And I'm starting to find myself as I I log everything I watch on Letterbox and the more I do ratings, the more guilty I feel about doing them because they don't really mean much. Because there's plenty of films that I do give four and a half stars. And there's going to be films that, I'll, that are four stars that I would probably consider greater, but it all comes down to personal taste. I mean, even the other day, uh, our friend Dimitri rated Bonnie and Clyde a 7 out of 10, and I think it's a brilliant film. It's one that really stuck out for me when I saw it, and I would give that a 9 out of 10, and I was like, why would you give it such a low rating? You know, and... But at, at the end of the day, it comes down to personal taste, and I think with ratings, I think it's just sometimes I just don't even want to use ratings anymore because yeah. it's not... It's not what I, I... I care about the discussion. I don't care about the rating. And that's that's what's good about Letterbox at least. You do give the rating and you have the option not to rate as well. Yeah. You can just leave it blank. Yeah. You see, that's something Letterbox has over IMDb because I would still use IMDb more because it has the phone app. I think Letterbox might be getting the does. phone app. No, it does. It does. It does have the phone app. I couldn't find it. But I anyway, get, yeah. that's beside the point. But I would only really use the ratings in IMDb as a method to log what films I've watched yeah. nowadays is generally the case because... Is it, what what constitutes a film being an eight rather than a seven or a, yeah. a five or a six or whatever? Like what? Like there's not like a guideline saying well, it has to have this, this, this. It's like films. It's films more than that. It's more than just that's nice, but it's more than a number. Yeah, it's it's an yeah. art form and it's just it's sub, it's subjective above all. I think's the important thing. Like a film's going to mean more to one person than it is to another, mm-hmm. than somebody else. I mean, yeah. ratings yeah. usually are an afterthought for me, but um, some people. As I say, again, it's the younger ones. It's the the ones that are like thirteen to eighteen, and they're film buffs. And I and I I have heard this from a few people that around fifteen you're getting big in the cinema, mm-hmm. and I've heard them say, you know, I would only give a five out of five to, you know, so, a very very select amount of films because no film's really perfect, and that's true. But that's like a really, just being critical yeah. for its own sake instead of appreciating something. Of course, nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. It's, of I, not. I say it's it's an art form. Like there's I mean, such things perfection. Contradictions. Life is full of contradictions. Mm. That is a, one of the best arguments you can bring to anything. Yes, that character might... Uh, if there's stuff with, with characters and pl- plot issues, is more different, but yeah. you know, with character contradictions, that's because humans contradict each other mm-hmm. uh, every day, constantly. You know? So I think, you know, judge, I think these things just get judged a little wrongly. I think it's unfair to say, oh, I'm not giving it a 5 out of 5 because it's not a perfect film. Like, well, what constitutes... If, if you love the five. film, if you walk out... If you love it, love it. ...ecstatic or utterly depressed in the case of, like, I mean, for example, a film I give five out of five is Requiem for a Dream. Absolutely flawless film of my mind. Yeah. Never want to see it again because that is a Not traumatic really. experience yeah. watching that film, but it's just if you, if you get a real emotional response and you cannot find any real flaw in your mind with that film, that, that to me would constitute Definitely. that. And then it all comes down to subjectivity. Yeah. Obviously. So. And I think another one to bring up now, because we're talking about how watching films has changed and with the internet being a big part of that, because, you know, we had these great critics, you had great critics like Pauline Kael, Roger Rabbit and Gene Siskel, all from America, of course, as well, American film criticism. And then over here, we'll have the likes of uh, Robbie Collins and Mark Kermode. Mark Kermode at the minute is, who I think is the best critic at the minute because of the fact that he doesn't do ratings. Exactly, as, as he doesn't know. do ratings, yeah. And I, I just think his insights are really 
interesting and his book his writing's really interesting he's a very entertaining mm. person to listen to and that's that's the end of it but film criticism used to be very different like film critics really were put on a pedestal like Roger yeah. Rabbit like they're especially Pauline Kael who actually wrote interestingly enough a 6,000 word review about why she didn't like uh, Bonnie and Clyde she didn't like Shoah either oh. and I have to disagree with both it's controversial <laughs> but yeah it's controversial indeed mm. but it's a six, that's a really long piece mm. that's a 6,000 word review why she didn't like Bonnie and Clyde in 1967 but mm. film critics don't have the same they don't have the same status anymore because because everyone's a critic because everyone's a critic now because of the empowerment of the internet you know yeah. but at the same time this is where we're gonna uh, that's a point I want to bring up because it it does make me ponder now that we'll have things like Netflix and the fact that so many people are creating things, there's mm. so many TV shows and miniseries and so many platforms yeah. creating their original content. Amazon are creating their original content. Netflix is creating mm-hmm. their original content. BBC has their own stuff and the list can go on. Channel 4 too. And it makes you wonder, with this amount of content, is there not some sort of... like? Do you not think maybe film critics do now need to be able to say what's worth watching and what's not? Do you think that helps people at the least? Yeah, I mean, at the same time, though, you got to take everything with a pinch of salt. Because even with these people who were probably putting the past all their stuff, I mean, with Kermode's a good example. He's someone I was still watched list, uh, big fan of his work. There's films, there's things he'll talk about, films he's watched, and he's say, oh, I thought it was just okay, or I didn't like it, or I liked it, and I would disagree. I would I would disagree with him. I would understand where he's coming from, etc. But at the same time, you got to realise, just because Kermode says go out and watch this film doesn't mean you should be phone your coat on rust spreading out the yeah. your local cinema just because one person said this film is worth watching I think you gotta be quite careful mm-hmm. sometimes you know I do, I do I still look at reviews after I've watched films a lot of the time now yeah. and I can see why people find them useful because there's so much content out there it is difficult to seek to, to think right what what is worth seeking out mm-hmm. now especially in the cinemas there's so many films especially if you think internationally as well about other films that come in uh, just it's a whole other a whole other gate hmm. and I mean there's also we're speaking of film critics like on Letterboxd but then you've also got the YouTube critics and like Chris the big ones are like Chris Duckman and Jeremy Jams also but then there's there's more analytical channels like hmm. Channel Chris Swell or Every Frame of Painting yeah. Jack's Movie Reviews um, Cinefix as well they're quite a uh, in, in great, depth great channel yeah. mm-hmm. and there's so many others you know that and now you see me is another one, uh, and they're they're a lot more about film analysis, and that's something that interests me more than all the reviews that are up at the minute. Mm-hmm. And again, you have to take it with a pinch of salt because I, I can't I I don't like and I'm I'm happy enough to say this, I do not like Jeremy Jones in the slightest, and if he's watching this, of which I can I sincerely doubt, <laughs> you know I don't like his style at all, I don't appreciate it in the slightest. Uh, Chris Duckman is okay, but these other channels I I do prefer. Um, but you know, but the, the those channels cater to a larger audience. It's more about popular mainstream Hollywood cinema, which is okay, fan yeah. movies and all that. But it's not for me. Yeah, well, there's a it's a double edged sword in a sense because you know, like, I mean, there's there was John's. It was what was the film? It was a film the other year. He he was going absolutely nuts about it, and after that, I was like, I'm not watching this guy again. It was probably Batman versus Superman. Or, I think it might have oh, been I... su- might have been Suicide Squad actually because, yeah. and that's. Oh, there's that's another that's another great thing to bring up is high ratings have actually affected cinema viewing because yes. Batman vs Superman haven't seen it don't intend to watch it and no I'm not gonna watch a longer cut of a film that I don't want to watch don't same as Suicide Squad yeah. but I think it was the director or producer who came forward it was a Brian Singer or something like that he no ah uh, that's but, he's with the Axe Man ones. okay um yeah that's right. But there was one of the producers or the director or something who claimed that Rotten Tomatoes had affected the film's uh, box office, even though the film like had a billion. Is it was this? Zach, <laughs> I think this might have been Zack Snyder or something. Yeah, it might have been Zack Snyder. It's, it's man, and also as a result of the negative press that uh, Batman vs Superman received, Suicide Squad apparently underwent extensive reshoots to try and make it a bit funnier because mm-hmm. the people talked about oh, the dark tone was the problem of Batman vs Superman. Which wasn't, but that's a completely other discussion. Which, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not really relevant here. But, yeah. but, uh, but that, uh, I, I mean, I've been a culprit myself in younger years. But I would, I would look at Rotten Tomatoes, and if it was a film that you know had under fifty percent, you know, I would, I would think to myself, there must be a reason for yeah. this. You know, if if 
if if two hundred critics are saying like this is probably not worth watching, it probably isn't worth watching. But sometimes that's where your taste can differ. Uh, most of the time, I'm usually on the critics side for the ratings. It's usually just how it pans out. But there's plenty of films that I think, wow, how did I not hear this film before? And you know why have not not many people reviewed it? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially with some of Mike Lee's content, which I think has been swept under the rug a little bit. Like Life is Sweet, which is a film that doesn't have the highest average ratings on Rotten Tomatoes, but I think it's an absolute absolutely brilliant film Mm -hmm. and that's just where it comes into personal taste and I think all these things can be taken for granted Mm -hmm. you're going to talk about as well times throughout history when the critics did get it wrong I mean the one example comes to my mind Citizen Kane right that was Lambas at the time even Wizard of Oz yeah films that got there like Citizen Kane is now lauded as one of the greatest films of all time something I agree with I think a lot of the brilliant films definitely even Rocky Horror Picture Show you know, it's a film that just took a while for audiences to latch onto, and now it's it's the longest running cult film that plays annually every single yeah. year. It's at least somewhere in in the UK and America. It play, it's always playing somewhere every year, and it's fascinating to think that it's a film that's lasted forty two years now, and people are still going to see that a cult film. And yeah, a lot of films weren't that well received when they come out and are now praised as absolute masterpieces, like mm-hmm. you said with. A really good perfect example is Citizen Kane a good example is Hitchcock because this man never won an Oscar in his life I don't think he's up for many nominations either mm. uh, his film all of his films I mean um, he did get the honorary Oscar in the 70s of course a uh, lifetime achievement which he should have got 10 years earlier you know a man who's worked 6 decades in cinema mm. and has made over 50 films and some of them are some of the most well known of the time but Vertigo I believe was not well received and there's another great one uh, looking at top lists Sight and Sound, famously, you know, Citizen Kane was on the top of everyone's list. It was always Citizen Kane. And then, suddenly, Vertigo was their number one choice for the yeah. greatest film of all time. Which happened a few years ago. Mm-hmm. So Vertigo was definitely one that critics got wrong at the time, but things changed. Right, well, basically, another example I'd like to bring up is about the last couple of Star Wars films. Whenever these films came out, and this actually applies to The Phantom Menace as well, is that you had, whenever these films came out, it was just everyone was like, great, yes, this is the Mainly the audience said, like, yes, this is brilliant, walked in and thought it was great. And then as time goes on, I've, I've especially noticed this with The Force Awakens recently, is that it just, the hype has died down and people are just completely against them now. It almost seems like it's cool now to, they hate these films. What's the I mean, I, yeah. I'm a big Star Wars fan myself. I very much enjoyed The Force Awakens, Rogue One, kind of, but not a discussion. <laughs> but yeah, they, it just seems to be, there's like one argument on the internet generally that it's this is the majority and if you're not with that majority, then who the hell are you? What You, you don't know what you're talking that's about. Another, that's another, it's a very fine point to bring up as well. That's like the, the hipster the movie yeah. scene. Maybe, yeah, maybe what yours. That's another thing. Like, mm. have your own opinion. Don't be scared to be one against a hundred. You know what I mean? If you like a film, you like a film. I've got guilty pleasures. You know, there's films that, I mean, I don't like it now because it really is just a badly made film, but I loved Aragon at one point. <laughs> That's right. I loved yeah. Aragon at one point in my life. I'm ashamed. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, you'll mm-hmm. like what you like, but when you, you know, I rewatched it years later and discovered this is actually really badly put together yeah. and isn't engaging at all. But that's what I mean. You know, when you're younger, you're more impressionable. But don't be scared to have your own voice and opinion. If you like a film, you like a film. If you don't like a film, you don't like a film. So, personally, would you think um, film reigns, like, you're just better off without them? Ah, oh, like, like I said, it's like, well, it's like everything in life. It's a double-edged sword. Some, like, it's ve- it is useful in the sense to have, get a rough idea of what are the films worth seeing and what are the films that maybe not so much. But at the same time, don't have to take over your life. Certainly not. Something else to bring up is Netflix because, again, we're talking about ratings, but I would get furious when I saw the likes of Son of Saul on Netflix having like a two out of five. Meanwhile... <sighs> Something, so, something like the ridiculous five. six or the cobbler has like four out of five or five out of five I'm just like I mean without seeing them like really Son of Saul <laughs> Son of Saul you know the film that won best mm. foreign film two years ago uh, a, a phenomenal film um, but it all comes down to taste and Netflix I think know that and they got rid of the ratings 
Uh, yeah. The reviews are still there, but people are only going to see the review thing of the use of a computer, which I'm going to say about 95% of people using Netflix today probably aren't using They're all using their TVs and their laptop or their yeah. phones or tablets or whatever. But now they have this thing and it's crap. It's a... Uh, you put a thumb up and a thumb down for things that you like and don't like and then they, they somehow know uh, it's a 98% match to your taste. You know? I've always wondered how they do that, but yeah, you know? I... You en- Magic. I'm you enjoyed Shinder's List. Why not watch The Smurfs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's never been it's it's never been too far off, but mm. at the same time, it's like yeah, it's just a little bit pointless. So I think I think the the real point of this discussion is just to say, you know, what do you think as well? Do you think ratings are useless? Do they help you? Do reviews help you? Do you mm. try to uh, not read that many before you see a film mm. because that's what I like to do. Or do you find them more useful afterwards so you can kind of uh, see what other people think to come to your own conclusion? You know, what importance do you think reviews and readings have? Anything else you'd like to add to that? Is there anything else you'd like to... No, that's really in? it. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm like yourself. I would tend to, if I know I'm going to see a film, I'd usually leave the reviews until after I've seen it. And then it's just, it's interesting to get other people's takes on it. Definitely. I like going in blind. Don't know about everyone else. It's really up to yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. But overall, I think like that's just something I just want to say to everybody is don't take ratings too seriously. Um, when it comes to your top favourite lists, just make your top favourite lists. Just talk about films that you love. And uh, mm-hmm. don't, you know, again, it's not like, oh, this film's not in my top 10. Or that, what, why isn't this film in your top 100 or top 200? Yeah. You know, don't... Every, everything's different. My, my top... My favourite film list would change every single day. And it, I always mm-hmm. update it. And it's like, at the end of the day, I'm just like, is it, does this even mean anything? And I've got plenty of video lists as well that are quite extensive, and I don't even like to think of films in orders. I think it's kind of pointless to think of films like, that's my number one, that's my number two, because I kind of like them all in different ways, and because, yeah. because film can't be seen that way. There's no such thing as the greatest film of all time, because there's such an emotional spectrum. You know, yeah. there's, there's, there's A film could be greatly comedic, uh, a film could be greatly sad, tragic, a film could be thrilling, a film could be horrifying. You know, and I think it's more important just to discuss and think why you enjoy a film on emotional levels and cerebral levels too, if it's political, if it's about society, if it's about, um, you know, just all these different kind of issues. You yeah. know, emotional things, if it's a human drama or if it's a political thriller. Everything's different, and that's why I think it, it can be useful for yourself, maybe. Um, but never take them too seriously. Well, that's it, everyone. Um, we didn't mention La La Land, which is definitely something that could have been brought up when discussing reviews and criticism because that is a film that's been lampooned but healed at the same time. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that next week when we look at La La Land as a review and kind of just an, uh, not an analysis, but a discussion of its reception mm-hmm. and also what we thought of it too. Um, that's it, everyone. Yep. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.